Welcome to Hash Knife Hangouts. I'm Kalen Carpenter. With me is my partner, co-host, and father, Brandon. Uh, before we get started, for those of you on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. You can shut off the notification bell if you want. For those on Facebook, like, comment, share, and on all platforms, all the time, spread the word to your friends. And now to the opening notes. Uh, and actually, before we get there, uh, we have been having some seriously cold weather, and I know a lot of people out there have been. Uh, even the northern texans i've been seeing some stuff on twitter those guys have been struggling with this cold what, weather what did it not get to used 50 to degrees for the northern texans man they some of them actually start hitting zeros and they were oh. they're having issues with calves because they uh they're not used to it and like yeah, I, those yeah those type of cattle aren't, aren't they're not cold weather cattle no well and that's why i i asked one of them that i actually communicate with quite a bit on twitter i'm like hey why are you guys doing it so early and like well we do it early because it gets way too hot when you guys normally do it i'm like oh Never thought about that, but it makes complete sense. So, yep, that's kind of the stuff that everybody's been dealing with is that giant Arctic blast. Um, but, yeah, the opening notes for this episode are and as follows. I was uh, watching the DNA video. Um, it was a discussion between Dad and uh, Suzanne Miller from the Dunrovin Ranch on the Monday morning socials uh, on January 25th. So that was actually a couple weeks ago. And uh, during that discussion, the topic of soaring, in the Tennessee walking horse community came up uh, in that original conversation about genetics. It, it kind of came back to that. Um, but why did it come up? It's because we were talking about Tweeba and how we register our horses. Now Tweeba stands for Tennessee walking horse breeders and exhibitors association. That's what it stands for. T W H B E A. Um, and of course, like any organization, you're not always going to have the greatest. You're not always going to have, all the greats or all the bads, like there's, there's things that go with each. Um, so, uh, w the big thing was what is soaring? So soaring is a, a lot of the times it's a process. And this is kind of a general definition where, uh, a process or a way owners or trainers use tools, chemicals, or like painful incentives to uh, create an animal to paw in the air. And I I'll see if I can do some trademark stuff and, and make sure we get a classic Walker picture in there. Um, a, a, Actually, a show walker right arena. Show walker. yes and if, and if anybody looks in the background of dad there's a trophy just above his head it's kind of pinkish purplish and that's actually kind of the silhouette but we can I'll, I'll see if i can get a good picture um and and those the soaring is used like i said uses tools chemicals or some incentives to make that really weird animated pawing appearance um the the walk is not natural but they try to make it they pawn it off to be so um, and it's all just for show, like we said. Um, the process is, again, they're, they're cruel, they're damaging, they can actually shorten the life of the animal, and of course, they can destroy the conformation of it, so bone structure and stuff like that. Um, so this kind of got me thinking about how we as humans have modified our animals, good and bad, for different things. And so where did I go? I went to some of the uh, classic websites of like ASPCA and PETA to get some uh, information. And so they said things like- Propaganda. You know, well, yes, but some of this was also, it was very valid. So beak trimming birds. was a thing for, um, you know, any birds. We don't do birds, so it's not our thing. Tail docking, they said, for dogs, cows, and pigs. Uh, declawing, a lot of times that's for, you know, cats. And then uh, the big ones that are kind of more related to us are sanitation and pens. And that's, that's one I want to talk to dad about, especially with like colts and stuff, because we've seen that with people. Um, hoarding. I think hoarding, there's a context to that because you can say that we hoard animals when we have a hundred head of cattle and that's not, that's not necessarily true. Um, now, if you have a hundred animals in like a hundred foot by hundred foot pen, that's different. Um, but there's a, psychologic, there's a psychological aspect to that. Right. Yeah. That's a good point too. Um, then also neglected injuries. That's, that's a big one for us because sometimes things get missed and, and we feel really bad when that happens. Uh, other examples that I thought of that aren't cruel, but they're actually useful are, um, the, the Appaloosa horse. A lot of the times people do that for beautification reasons. They just kind of shorten their tail, the, the mane or the, not the, uh, the mane, but the hair in the tail gets just shortened. That's it. And a lot of people will do that, um, in places where there's cockleburs and, and a lot of, um, spiny or, or prickly, uh, weeds, because then it's like the horse is whipping around a weird bat on their on their tail and they can actually hurt themselves. So getting it shortened so that they don't have all those weeds in there is actually a big thing. Well, uh, sometimes, and, and uh, uh, draft horses the same way. 
Mm-hmm. A lot of times the tails are shortened, but it's the hair, not it's not anything else. It's just the hair. Right, not the bone you know, structure. There's, no, there's no tail docking going on there. And then uh, there's things like cropped manes, which is again, it's like buzzing the hair off of a horse, um, just where the mane is. Uh, bridle and halter paths, which are essentially a five or six inch uh, cropped mane at a, at a spot where the bridle or, or halter will cross over their neck. Um, tail and mane braids for with ribbons and bows. That's just for show. That's beautification for, you know, I don't know, parades and stuff like that. Uh, and then some things that have been sold as cruel, but they're not, are flank straps for like bulls and horses and rodeos. Um, it all it does is it makes things uncomfortable. It doesn't go around testicles. It doesn't go around the private regions at all of any of those animals. It's just to get them to do an animated bucking movement, and that's makes them kick out more. Yeah, so, and and that's all it does. And then just trying course, to kick it off. Yeah, yeah, and of course that helps bolster the the hashtag buck rodeo movement because they don't want to um, have any sort of rodeo events going on. So our agenda will focus around that with the various beautification ideas or situations and how they hurt, harm, or, or provide issues to animals. So what's kind of your initial thoughts on that, Dad? Well, just kind of go back to one is the Appaloosa breed. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't necessarily take the hor- or the, the tail hairs and treat them any different than any other breed unless you would be in, you know, like some uh, riparian areas where there's a lot of cockleburr where that tail picks up a lot of those seeds from a cockleburr. And it'll just get matted. And that's with any horse. Yeah. But uh, the Appaloosa breed itself uh, tends to, in, in some lines and sometimes, uh, they just don't grow hair on their tails. There's just no hair there. Or limited hair, very little hair. And so, um, you know, they don't have a way to swat flies. And I've seen, I've seen some appies with, I mean, no hair on their tail, basically. And they're, man, that old tail is whipping back and forth because that's the that's the natural response but there's nothing there and and they'll yeah. actually wear themselves or can wear that tail a little raw uh where it bangs on the back of their hips but it is not that is not something that people do to a horse that is a natural um just a genetic thing that happens with some appies and there i'm sure there's some other breeds around the world that i don't know i don't know every dang breed there is there's you know we got a whole globe full of, of horses and uh, different breeds, different offshoots of, of breeds, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so there's no, I just wanted to make sure that people knew that that was not something that you do that you de hair a tail. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing uglier than a horse with no tail. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it well, doesn't look normal. And that, that brings me up. That makes me think of the, uh, the time we had memory. She had some sort of, we, we don't know what it was it, either some sort of like fungal disease or skin disease or something. And she lost a lot of hair. And if people yeah. don't know, what we're talking about imagine a horse in the summertime and their hair gets even shorter than that like they become just the skin underneath a lot of it was like she was patchy almost like she had mange almost her tail well, it was almost like an out. alopecia yeah like like a human alopecia and that's what the vet thought well maybe it's maybe it's that you know so yeah. we treated it as if there was a some kind of an underlying fungus or bug that you couldn't right. see. I mean, she looked just, it was just, she was a black horse and it was just looked straight away, black skin. And then you'd have patches of hair. Uh, or I think she probably lost 50% of her hair. Yeah. I would and, say that. and a yeah, lot of her was, tail, her, like it was yeah. most noticeable is her tail. So that's what I was thinking of is, you know, sometimes it's not just somebody doing something to the animal. Sometimes it's like a, like, like any, human it might be a disease or something too right and and so that that uh mare we treated her for a summer an entire summer and through the fall and then her hair started coming back and then it came back and she was completely fine so we're not sure usually an alopecia areata uh type of issue most of the time i think is permanent uh, unless it's stress induced or something like that. You know, I mean, there was a time in my life where, um, I had some, the, my beard starting to fall, had a big old patch growing on my, on my face and hair was falling out and it was just cause of stress. Right. And so it, you know, reduced the stress and, um, it came back. So I told my boss, if it ate my mustache, that he was going to be in some serious shit. <laughs> I did. Uh, so uh, moving on, I, I think we'll start with some of the, the negative stuff and, and the things that I kind of highlighted for us. And yeah. 
And the one I really want to touch about, we, we we're on the horses uh, part of it right now. So let's stick with that is sanitation and pens. I know there's been times where we have in, in thinking specifically about foals and, and brand new colts, the, we always are very cognizant of letting the mare um, foal in the pasture as much as possible, because if they foal in the pens, the um, umbilical cold air, umbilical cord area can get infected. And that's, we, you have seen that firsthand where somebody has had to put iodine into the navel, correct? And do that on a regular basis. And yeah, actually trim the navel, the, uh, the core back. Cause it gets, you know, it'll start draining you get, mm-hmm. and it, like any infection. That's an really, it's an opening to the rest of the blood source, you know, uh, in vitro. So they, you have to trim that, um, umbilical cord close. And then with a long swab, dipped in iodine and reach up there because you can imagine how fun that's got to feel right uh first the you know going up inside and then with iodine i mean that stuff burns if they've ever had that in a cut and so you got to do that a couple of two three times a day you're trying to get rid of that infection and and let it drain and it it can cause behavioral problems i mean now you get a, a young colt that's associating you with pain pain and you know, i mean I don't blame them. I wouldn't either. So, um, yeah, that, that's something that even, even if it's uh, questionable whether or not, uh, they could get an infection, even though if a horse, you know, she pulled in a pasture and say the pasture, that area had a lot of, uh, just a lot of dirt. And it, it was a spot like that where there wasn't a lot of grass or something. Um, I would, you still dip that navel completely in iodine. And we do that with some of the calves in the corral that we calve when we have heifers. When we have uh, some of our first-time heifers, I want to be able to help them because first-time heifers can be really stupid uh, about their calves. They, you know, they, they don't really realize what's going on. They kind of do, but kind of don't. And sometimes they they just do stum- dumb stuff. So you got to keep them close. Well, you know what? Just because they're in a corral doesn't mean they need to quit pooping or peeing. They do. So, and again, they're dumb about it. So they'll just lay down anywhere. And you cannot in the winter time like now. Good luck trying to trying to pick up or keep uh, poop piles picked up with a cow. And it's just it's impossible, especially if you've got you know 15, 20 head of of heifers or something that you're going to calve. So as soon as those calves are up and they've sucked or they don't even have to get up yet with a calf, I don't even worry about that bonding process quite so much because that cow is going to take care of that. Um, get that navel completely uh, uh, dipped in an iodine bottle and I spread it around. I'll actually kind of turn them on their side and shake that. So that whole area has got some uh, iodine wash on it to kill any kind of uh, a bug or anything that could get up in there. And, and then you eliminate that problem. Well, and that's a, it's a big deal for us because not only you're, you're willing to put in a little extra effort in the front end, because otherwise it becomes an invasive situation that can, like, it takes up time every single day for the next week couple weeks or months depending on what's going on and and so we also are proactive in in making sure that pens are cleaned up if not yearly at least seasonally or something like that so that oh there you know there's getting to be a lot of muck let's get the the uh tractor and clean it out and throw that out and then i think you've brought up at at, at times hey let's go get some straw because they're not going to eat the straw but they can use it and that can help kind of create a a layer as well to protect them from that, that gross, disgusting muck that's underneath. Yeah. And, and that straw really is a, as an insulation uh, barrier for a calf or, you know, a cow try just trying to make it easier on them. They'll, they'll eat straw if they're hungry. And I mean, I've seen people uh, have that as part of their, their thing in the wintertime where they're feeding straw to yearlings, uh, particularly yearling steers, yearling heifers sometimes, but you know, all it is is a filler for them, but they're, they're feeding cow cake very heavily. They're getting all of their nutrition and uh, everything they're going to need out of the cake. Straw the filler, keeps that gut and that rumen working, and uh, it's cheap. So really, and, and if they had it available, I mean, what else are you going to do with, with some straw except use it up? And that's right. one, that is one way to do it. I always kind of thought, oh, God, that's a little tough. I, you know, I don't know as I'd want to necessarily live on you know, rice like that, oh, rice cakes, basically. 
but the straw is, is more of an insulation value. Feed them up good. Make sure they've got plenty of hay. Like right now in this cold, we're feeding fifty uh, percent more hay every day for our yeah. cows. Just and they're and they're Bringing eating calories. because they're just trying to maintain uh, body heat with calories. Yeah, they're it's tough on them. So, so yeah, no, that's uh, it, it's something we do to keep an animal from getting an infection. Uh, you take a week old calf, and they're a whole lot harder to handle. Believe me, than you know. Sometimes that would be a, a two person job to try to try to swab a navel or something. So do that right off the bat it takes minimal amount of time and then keep maintaining the health of that calf and uh less that you have to do less chance of you getting hurt and then you've also got a cow standing over the top of you every day that wants to tear you apart because you're doing yep. something to her calf yeah i mean there's a there's a lot of negative things that take place there. there's nothing positive comes out of that right and and then moving on to the next one the thought of like hoarding because sometimes that can go together is sanitation and hoarding because if you get like you were saying too many animals in one confined spot that you know the muck starts to raise up very quickly but then it's also again context because you know we having 50 horses at one point you could have said we were hoarding but they also had an open pasture they you know we would bring some into the corrals they, they were managed there's a difference between throwing a bunch of animals and livestock into a very confined area and not taking care of them or neglecting them and having that same amount of animals and making sure that they have the proper amount of space to be a horse or be a cow or something like that. Well, and, and I think hoarding implies that you're never going to get rid of an animal, that they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. They're staying there. And, and that's clearly yeah. not the case. I mean, we make uh, a living off the cows and the horses and there are horses that have been around. Uh, there's a couple of them. You're, you're gilding flax and, uh, Braden's gilding mountain man, um, you know, bet is a gilding I ride. It was, uh, my dad's and those horses are around. They're not going to go anywhere because we use them, but they're also, um, something that you have had since you were a little kid. Um, but the mares and the colts, uh, yearlings, two-year-olds, those are all part of a training and sale, uh, aspect. We're not keeping them for, because we want to have more horses. I mean, if you did that, there's a fast way to go broke. Right. You know, I mean, I, when I think of hoarding, I think more of uh, uh, dogs and certainly some individuals with cats. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some, uh, we had an older, older lady, uh, lived alone. I mean, the stereotypical cat woman, right? And uh, I remember she was very elderly, very frail, very sweet person, but she would feed those cats before she would feed herself. And that was, she lived in town. And sometimes she would go to the, uh, have to go to the hospital or the doctor or whatever, and be gone for a few days. And some of the, you know, the men around the, around town would get together and they would go and euthanize some of these cats that needed, I mean, I mean, a hundred cats or so. I mean, Jeez. and this woman would feed them before she would feed herself. And so they would thin the cats out and they'd leave her, you know, 10, 12 cats. And it was, it's really bad. I mean, that's, you, you shouldn't let that get out of hand and spaying and neutering at that time, you know, 40, 50 years ago was really not something that was uh, thought of too much and, and good luck catching a feral cat to spay oh, or yeah. neuter it. What's the point? You know, I mean, and it's eating birds like crazy. Uh, so that to me is hoarding. Uh, there was no good purpose for it. She didn't have it. She was not a breeder. Uh, they were living at her detriment. Her health uh, suffered because of it. So to me, that's hoarding. Um, and people say, you know, they're using that argument, I think, a lot of times in, you know, these uh, nutty groups that, you know, they, they're not going to eat anything other than something that grows green. And they're, all they're doing is they're competing for food with my food, which, you know, so, but, you know, they don't, they don't want cattle, they don't want hogs, you know, and, and those are confinement type chickens, hogs, uh, those are confinement type animals in high production. And you know what? I've been to some of those places that those animals are not um, abused. They're an animal. They are there for a food source. Uh, and I'm sure, again, there are some that are like not run well. I'm probably never going to see those because, you right. know, that's what they do is they, they're not going to put that out there. So um, I'm sure there are some abuse. There, there, there can't not be with that many uh, people doing, doing uh, what they're trying to do. But um, that's, most of the things I've ever seen are like, are, are not detrimental to the animal 
in a in a true animal husbandry type setting. Oh, there's it, you know that you talked about like like pigs specifically. What where where do you think there's like a fine line or is there a fine line between uh production of hogs and because they hogs can they can pro- reproduce so quickly that mm-hmm. I I can imagine that there somewhere there is a fine line between essentially hoarding and and just doing um mass production of uh hog be, uh, of hogs because of the the pork requirements and stuff like that where where do you think that is because at, at some point i i can imagine somebody's you know they're overproducing and then you have too many animals in a confined place and and there's all these different things and i'm just saying hogs because i you know that's that's one of the more stereotypical ones i think of because they do reproduce so fast and and they're actually a decently larger animal livestock wise and and that's why i was thinking that but what are, what are your thoughts on that well i think that that there's a real misconception that anytime anything is is confined or housed it's because you care about it and love it mm-hmm. no not necessarily it depends on where these animals are are raised what, what's the climate like i mean some smaller animals uh I'm saying piglets from the time, you know, they're on the sow for a time and then they're weaned from her. And usually they're kept inside on a, on a larger facility like that simply because of their health. And so that they don't die. You know, I mean, if you, if you try to, you, you'd, you'd be losing animals out here, you know, in the weather we're in right now. So they have got to a place to have a place to go. Now they're, you know, their body temperature is about 105 degrees or so normally and it's amazing to watch those uh animals in the cold you give them a place to bed down say some straw because we've raised hogs um on a, on a small scale and and uh dad worked for a guy who did it on a large scale and it is amazing the cold that they can take if they can get out of the wind and they can get laid down on some straw it's amazing how warm it is so they can adapt but that's a larger animal too that's that's you're starting to get up there around 100 150 pounder they usually go to market at 200 to 250 pounds, you know, two and a quarter, somewhere in there. So I think a good example of that hoarding argument and why it's false is you look at a year ago when the COVID outbreak took place and some of the slaughter plants were processing plants were shutting down. Okay. Right. You don't hoard an animal like that in a confined place because you're making more of them for one. And you can't, like us, we're a year out, nine months out when we're breeding cows to have calves in the spring. And you breed a cow, you can't predict what's going to happen in a year. You, you can't predict what's going to happen in 90 days or 100 days. And that's, you know, that's where you're looking at on your life cycle uh, for your, your hog. So you got a bunch of hogs that are going to be going into the food chain through processing plant on schedule. All of a sudden, people start shutting down processing plants, and you've got this now. That now everything stops, and you get a backup of a place to go for these animals that are made for a food source, and you can't get rid of them. Now you got to feed them, and the margins on hogs are horrible anyway. You know, sometimes they're mm-hmm. good, sometimes they're bad, but you know, you get the high volume, so you know, you hopefully you can make that. But what was going on with a lot of these pork producers, swine swine operations? when this pandemic started and it started shutting down some of the places, do you remember what happened? Oh, they had to start euthanizing. They, they held on as long as they could, but then at a certain yes. point, they just had to start euthanizing and, and essentially watching it's, it's like taking corn or wheat and harvesting it and then burning it. Yes. That's what happened. Exactly. Right. That's not hoarding again. They you and, and some of these groups they use these arguments that are arguments for people who don't understand. And that mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. That by at that point is propaganda. When you when you say something that's not true, to garner an emotional response to drive a particular um, behavior, that's propaganda. And so there there were people from South. There's a, a group in South Dakota at a apparently a fairly large place, and we saw ads in the paper here. They would deliver them to you. They would deliver the hogs to you, and and for like. 25, 30 bucks, 50 bucks per hog. And they would drive them all this way because they didn't want to euthanize them either. Yeah. So they're almost giving them away. They're covering the cost of their, of their fuel just for a place to get these animals out so that they don't 
uh, you know, so they're not getting uh, or try, try well, to keep it, them from it not doesn't just used. go to waste. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's not hoarding. And it doesn't matter whether you're raising two hogs. If you're raising, let's say you got uh, uh, two, two uh, sows that are breeding with a boar or, or a, a sow and a boar, and you're producing hogs out of them and you're raising them up and people come to you and they say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a hog. I want a hog and you take it to the, the uh, processor for it. They pay you for the weight. Big deal. Done. Okay. What's the difference between two hogs and 2,000 head of hogs? And believe me, there's 2,000 head operations. Mm -hmm. What's the difference when you're still doing exactly the same thing? You may not be doing it on a private treaty basis, but you're doing it with a, a packer or, uh, you know, Pierce Packing Company in Billings used to do that. And they're out of business now, The peer, called the Pierce Group. Uh, and they used to have, if some of the older people of my age and older will remember, packages of bacon with Old Faithful on the, on the label. It was mm -hmm. Old Faithful brand. And that was the Pierce packing in Billings, Montana. Went all over, all over the states. Um, you would take in, or I mean, they took in truckloads of hogs to be processed, you know, every day. Somebody was bringing in, or every other day. I mean, they had they had different different things they were doing, but um, that's that's no different in the scope of why. So, if you got two thousand head of hogs that are supplying pork for a region, what's the difference between that and you doing two hogs and taking you know eight to ten piglets, raising them up to a uh, wiener size, then finish size, and then selling them outright? No difference. That's not hoarding. It's if you were not selling them because you just love pigs and you had too many pigs that you more than you could support, that's the, that's where the problem begins. Is something detrimental happening to those animals or to you or to the ground you're running them on? Are, are you producing an issue or a problem that is counterproductive? If so, that then I think that could be argued to be hoarding. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that can lead to the next thing I was thinking of is you get too many of them and they get injured and, and neglected injuries because that's something that we've always been very cognizant of too, is, you know, other animals that just like people, animals have their own personalities and they don't always get along. And so they'll hurt each other or some of them, again, being like normal humans, they may not think entirely. And so they'll get themselves into trouble and accidentally hurt themselves. And so there's a, there's a line between, <laughs> neglected injuries or injuries that have been you know accidentally missed because there's definitely been times where we have missed injuries and we're like oh man I, we, and then we feel bad and we're trying to make up for lost time because the the scar the scarring and the the healing process has already begun and it, you're kind of having to go backwards to try and fix things and and when you see an animal out specifically like thinking of horses and stuff if we if you were to see an animal in our pasture that has an injury it's not because we're not taking care of it. It's because we just haven't seen it yet. And sometimes that's the hardest part is just noticing it. And that's why we always check when we see them, we, we check their noses and toeses. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, we always are, are like when I'm feeding this time of year, those animals are right there. I mean, they're, they're wanting fed. Right. And so it gives you a really good chance. How many times do we, do we drive past them as they're feeding eating you think you might see something, so you get out and you walk through them. Um, that's what you do. I mean, you're always looking for something. Are they starting to lose uh, some muscle mass? Um, you know, some of these cows at the end of the fall, some of the older ones are a little thin because that, and, and typically they're raising a bruiser of a calf and it just, they're just sucking the life out of them, literally. And so they get them off, the, you wean them and get them off that calf and then they start to recover. And, and, uh, it's, a, it's not a great time for recovery because the grass is dried. It's brown. Uh, you know, it isn't lush and, and high protein and the protein is there, but it's not a really good lush grass that you get a fast gain on. So we supplement, you know, we we're watching them, give them plenty of cake, um, all the mineral and variety of mineral that they can have free choice. Uh, you know, we're, we're watching looking for any kind of parasites, you know, worming program, uh, uh, topical lice and, and lice is something that everybody fights. I mean, it's just, they are, they're dormant when it's warm. And then when it gets cold, man, they, they come to life and they start chewing high, uh, hair off of the cows and they look like they look horrible. 
And that's why you got to, you got to stay on it. Got to get on that side sort of stuff. So you're constantly looking for them. You're right. And there are times when something will happen. And I bet you 10 minutes after you've looked at them, it's happened. And then yeah. two days later, you come back, uh, especially particularly the horses, because they, they wander and they, they will travel for grass. They'll travel for water. The cows don't move from water that, that much, you know, they will, if they have to, but, uh, horses are, they're travelers. And so you might not see them for two days. You come back and you're like, are you kidding me? When did that happen? And we're like, I didn't see that last time. Did you guys see that? No, nope. that no. definitely was fine. So you've gone two days now with an injury and okay, bring them in. And now you're tending it and you're taking care of it because you're not going to just ignore it. That right. isn't going to happen. You, you've got to take care of that animal. Well, and what, they do, what they, they fight. Yeah. And I was going to say, what happens if you also, you do ignore it? I mean, you could the animal itself could potentially die or right. um, suddenly, you know, a limb just doesn't work. And then you have a three legged horse, essentially, even though it's got a fourth one, just kind of dang dangling there. Um, right. Th it, that can happen on, on anything at any time. I mean, th yeah. those kinds of things have a potential to happen. You just try to minimize anything that can happen. And, and there's some things you don't mix. You don't mix two, two mature boar hogs. Don't mix them. They'll kill each other. One will mm. kill the other one. And I mean, they are unbelievably vicious uh, to each other. I mean, you know, they grow tusks, you know, the, the, given, given their ability, a hog will revert back right back to a, like a razorback style, you know, like the Southern hogs right. in just a few generations. It takes no time at all. It's amazing how that will, will uh, occur. And those things are vicious. And if anybody ever hunted hogs and I have not, but I know a few that have, and I, and I know the reputation is you get, you get cornered by a hog. Uh, you better either be able to put it down because it will charge you and it will, it will tear you up. Um, they're almost like a miniature Cape Buffalo. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have a coming apart party and, and you're the one that's coming apart. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I think another thing too is injuries are not always just um, they're physical, but they're not, uh, physical in appearance, I should say, because it's not always like barbed wire or something stuck them or something like right. that. We, we have to look at, okay, how's the cow or the horse moving? How's what's their gait look like? Because, Oh, they're limping. Okay. What's going on? Is it their feet or is it their leg? Or like you said, are they losing back muscle issue. mass back yeah. issue? Yeah. Yeah. It can be a stifle, a joint, uh, uh ligaments. They could have uh, pulled some tendons, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things you could have, on a horse, you've heard the term bowed tendon, uh, pull a stifle, you know, all of that kind of stuff on this particular on the back, back end of a horse back legs. But, but no, you, you, you're bringing this kind of back around. I see with the soaring issue with horses and oh, yeah. uh, particularly show horses. And. Oh, I think he lost his Wi-Fi. but yeah, dad, dad's absolutely right. It's the, the point of show horses, they can get, um, soaring from, like, like we had said chains or sometimes they put bricks on, um, like what they'll, what they'll do is, uh, you take a horseshoe and on that horseshoe, there is a, um, a very heavy, um, or, or dense wood, or sometimes even a, a metal plate. And, um, what ends up happening is that, uh, that extra weight on the foot, I'm trying to text him in case his uh, Wi-Fi is down, uh, that extra weight forces the horse to pick their foot up higher. It's like uh, if you were to take yourself and um, you were to add uh, anything to your um, foot, you're normally uh, you have a really heavy uh, boot or something like that. Um, you, then what happens is you, you take that heavy boot and uh, you're walking and your, your, your feet are getting used to it. And then suddenly you end up, uh, then getting used to it and your feet, when you, what happens as soon as you take those, that heavy boot off, then you put a lighter one on your feet, start like walking really heavy. Right. So that's what they normally do. Um, and then I know dad is, uh, talking about specifically like injuries. Cause that's what kind of what we were doing was injuries. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the same, it's the same principle is, is doing that. And, uh, um, I, I don't know, do you, I was talking about when you kind of got thrown offline, but I, I went into yeah. the, the part about um, how 
you can use weighted shoes to kind of make force the legs to go up and 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 you, it's like putting on a heavy boot and you kind of you're, you're trudging around trudging around and then you go to something lighter and suddenly your feet will pick up easier and it's like that but then you can also do it with chains and in and, and the hurting and the soaring process and 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 how that results in um trying to take take care of the physical aspect even though you may not always see it because i think that's what you're kind of going toward well i i was kind of headed towards that direction yeah you froze up and knocked me offline or something happened it must be the the molecules were froze this morning they're not moving too quick electron shell orbitals are not working so anyway uh yeah i was on a monologue there trying to hope for it to come back but um the thing about uh, the weights on the feet uh heavy shoes thick padded shoes um, it's almost to me like when you're in, in high school and we would wrap sandbags around our legs, mm-hmm. there were sand, there were weights. And if you got used to that, what it did is essentially built up some of your muscle on your legs so right. that you're using them and you're picking your feet up and you're changing the dynamics of how that muscle fires when you need to run and jump and step. Mm-hmm. And then you you'd wear those things for, you know, every waking moment for, you know, a week or so. And it was amazing how light you felt right. and how much more you could, you could uh, push your body and particularly your legs and thighs. Also, it was hard on your joints. You know, you know, your knees could take uh, a beating on that uh, with that extra weight, your ankles. So that was not without detriment, but it didn't matter when you're that age. And the coach was like, Hey, we need to, we need to have you run faster, jump higher. But uh, it's the same thing I was, I was saying with the uh, riding two-year-old Colts. I used to train a lot of two-year-olds, but I was a whole lot lighter than I am now. And I was very, very careful about how much I rode them. You don't want to hurt them uh, because they're developing. Their bones are developing. Well, a lot right. of times, some of the show folks, they want to prove that this horse is going to be worthy of their show ring. So they'll, be, they'll ride these Colts at 18 months old. And they're trying to get the best gait out of them, and they're and they're doing all of this stuff to them, um, and which I I don't agree with. I don't think it's again. This is the difference between being truly detrimental to an animal and training them. And and this is this is something that I don't believe is when you, when you can shorten the life of a horse because they can't move, and they need to be euthanized, or you know, and it may not happen immediately. It can happen over five six years seven, eight years, and then you see what uh, the damage that's been done. So when that happens, that's not, that's not right. That's not, that's not for the betterment of the animal. That is strictly for you trying to win a shiny ribbon and a piece of tin in a competition or to put uh, a designation that your horse uh, won a grand championship, world grand championship that only takes place in a very small place. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like calling the Super Bowl the, world champions well it's a well, kind of the only place we really play football so exactly. okay, big deal um but some of the things that they do to achieve those are inhumane mm-hmm. truly inhumane and they're they're uh serious enough about how they do it or how it has been done that there are animal cruelty laws passed because of it at, at the federal level so when you have a when you have a show and we've been to some shows we used to take our colts that didn't have that much training on them and put them in shows knowing we weren't going to win. The whole point was it was a training exercise that you have all these people around have all these different horses around and you're doing something completely different for, with them. It was really a desensitization type of event and you're able to, to do something. And when you have a, a member of the USDA that it's mandatory that they're at that event and they are physically looking and palpating horses legs you've probably got a problem in your industry. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. You know, and so. Well, it's it's kind of the same with like why you have to have in sports, you have to have drug testing. There's probably a problem. (laughs) That's why you got to do it. Well, horse racing, you want to stick with a horse theme. You've got, you've got that as well. But yeah, that extends to anything because people, they'll do anything to get a, again, a piece of, a a piece of uh, ribbon and a piece of shiny tin that it's attached to, to hang on their wall. And, And we do that with our individuals. You took it how many, like you say, the drug testing, how many pro athletes are dead? Uh, and the one that I always think about is a guy who was just a freaking animal 
on the football field was a guy named Lyle Alzado. He played for the Denver Broncos, and he was taking anabolic steroids like crazy. The guy was, he was just unbelievable what he could do. Right. And guess what? Developed brain tumor. Yep. Dead at a young age. So, um, you know, what's it worth to you? If that's, a, if that's your personal thing, you know, I guess you got some free will, but a lot of these animals, all these horses are not exhibiting free will just by the very fact that we own them. So, you know, and there can be argued that, yeah, you shouldn't be on their back because that's not what they're meant to do. It's like, well, you know what? They're a tool. Right. Oh, they, they, it's, it's a living tool that we'll take care of, but yeah, a tool yeah. nonetheless. I would give it a, the best life I can possibly give it to. And, and, and that's no different than a dog. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a couple of dogs here that could be used for, for cow work. They're clearly not because they're uh, <laughs> staying in the house at night. And you got one that is, is, is absolutely worth nothing other than a companion animal. Mm-hmm. That's it. Right. That's his purpose, you know, and I'm okay with that, you know, and, and he's got probably the best life. I wish I could die and come back as one of your mother's dogs. <laughs> Jesus, I think I'd be a better off than I am now. Yeah, probably. Uh, another thing. So I think we've kind of hit on all the, all the bad stuff, but the, the nice things too, that, and they're not even necessarily nice things. They're all they are is they're, uh, they're aesthetically pleasing for some, not aesthetically pleasing for others, but like cropped manes and, and, uh, uh, halter and bridle paths. I think of, think of like cropped manes specifically, um, I, I haven't seen a lot of horses with a fully cropped mane, but you do see it with mules. And I I would say I would probably prefer mules with a cropped mane. And that's just, it's just their look. That's all it is. There's nothing really to it other than yeah. they just buzz their hair. There, it's, it's called roaching, roaching yeah. mane. And uh, it's, yeah, they're, they're really serving no purpose other than, and it could be argued that we could use it on our horses because of the windy area we live in. Those horses' manes get, I mean, they get just tangled up. Right. If, we call them uh, witches' anybody, knots. We call them witches' knots. Yeah. The, that the, my grandpa told me, yeah, witches have been riding those horses at night. Look, they got a couple of knots in their manes. I'm like, yeah, what do you mean? He goes, oh, they have to wrap their hands, those old bony hands, they have to they wrap them up with that mane. And that's how they hold onto them horses when they're riding them at night. So they're called witches' knots. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, in this country with the wind we get is it would be much easier if we roached their manes because yeah. you wouldn't have those knots in them. But yeah, I like a, I like a full mane. I like seeing that. And you'll see it on, uh, uh, used to see it much, much more in some of your like team ropers and rodeo people would, would mm-hmm. roach a mane, uh, particularly on your, on your rope horses. Um, you know, like the, why, why do, well, and you know what, there are, there's a purpose to some of the, uh, communication like mules you would put bells on their tails and 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 not necessarily it wasn't a bell but you would you would uh, uh, cut in a flat spot and then it would come up and then you would you would bell it down and then flatten it out close to the the tailbone and then bell it out and flatten it out and what that was was a communication issue if you had one bell that horse could only be packed mm. yeah that's if right. you had two bells they could be, you know, it was basically, it was a, a visual of what, will, and it told everybody else about this mule, if they weren't around them, what that mule would do. The second one, you know, they're just starting their ride. And the third one, you could ride, pack, you could do anything with them. You could lead, lead. I mean, it was just different stages of their training or their abilities where they were at. So you, so they would, they would put bells on and it's called belling the, uh, a mule. And then of course, most mules are, have a flat tail. The, the tail is just flattened off for aesthetics on the on the uh hair part does not hurt them doesn't do anything different it's just aesthetics so yeah there's some things that are like okay big deal yeah and and to to kind of um i guess clarify some of that stuff with the belling it also is uh that i think that comes from like mining camps right where uh, much like westerners typically do not do mass herds like the native americans did on the prairie but mining camps was a little different because it was just the nature of the lifestyle. Cause guys were doing, you know, I mean, they're doing hot cots and stuff like that. Like there was no personal space. I mean, guys were constantly mo- moving and working 24 seven. So those animals were also moving and working 24 seven. So having that stuff available where it's a simple, Oh, let's just mess with their, 
hair as a communication system, it makes things a lot easier and more efficient as a business or as an industry, a mining industry to grab something that you know is going to be useful for what you're trying to do. And you can do that. Yeah. That's a lot of those were, were necessarily the miners. I mean, that was their job. So you had mule skinners, you yeah. had your wranglers that, that were doing that, but yeah, there was a group of them. So you may have, you may have somebody who's contracted to do nothing but haul, haul food up and or out you know, on some of those areas to where it could get to, uh, another, another spot, um, uh, you know, <laughs> up, uh, the Boulder river South of, uh, big timber, there's a spot up, uh, near blue Lake where the uh, Jaeger mine was, and it's still remnants of it are still there. And halfway down, right at the halfway part, there's a, there's a uh, place that's a fishing access night access site now, and it's called chippy park. And I didn't realize what Chippy Park was, but Chippy Park was basically exactly the half point mark where the mining company would, the guys would get their time off and they'd, they'd, they'd go down headed to Big Timber. And I, I don't know if the mining company really did it. They may have, wouldn't surprise me because those were like company type, you know, uh, sawmills where you shop at the company store and all that money you're just basically slave labor they pay you but they're they're going to end up with your money anyway and your labor mm -hmm. but um what they would do is they would bring the prostitutes from town up halfway and they would meet at this park and the girls and they had uh, uh alcohol the guys didn't have to go to town they had wine women and song right there and those guys would spend all of their money yep with the prostitutes and on the booze and when they were out of money, then they'd go back up the mountain and the chippies would head back down. So that's why it's called Chippy Park. So it's interesting. Uh, you know, people are, you know, they're, they're transporting them down. So they're, they're either riding down or walking down or, you know, whatever. But um, not everybody had animals. You know, the, the, all of those miners didn't have them or the logging industry is the same way because uh, everything was done with, with, with horses and mules then. Uh, even your, you know, your farming was done that like my grandpa, that's all they did was farm with a lot of teams of horses. And like he said, the, when the, uh, when the eight in Ford tractor showed up, they hung their harnesses up and they never used them again because it was easier to reach up and turn a key off and let that thing sit instead of taking harness off, taking care of animals. And then the whole process was so much faster and easier because they did had a whole lot less maintenance. So the right. th thank thank the eight N Ford tractor for for killing uh, animal you know uh, use for uh, all of almost everything like that that they could they could get a hold of. So um, yeah, but but you're right. You had a group of people using animals. Not all of them know those animals intimately. So there were definitely markers as to what this animal can do, and it's just a communication system. So. Um, you know, you can see horses. If I saw a horse with a, a cup and I did not know them and I saw a couple of saddle galls on their shoulders, I'd be like, if I had to pick a horse, I'd pick the best one I could that looks like he's been ridden and ridden a bunch because you don't want to get on something that's not been ridden. I mean, that's, that's yeah. not going to work for you, you know, especially if you're in a hurry, you need to get something done. So, I mean, there's just sign that you can, you can tell, well, sometimes that sign is purposeful. Yeah. Well, and and now that you say that, that, that's a good point too, is when we're looking at horses, sometimes it's not even at this point, it's not even on purpose. We just see something. We're like, Oh, that horse, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a, a saddle sort or, uh, they've been ridden a lot. They're older. You can see the way their back is laid out and, Oh, they, like you said, galls behind essentially the armpit. You see like a little, um, a bare spot and it might be a little bloody or it might be just calloused over depending on how, how well somebody's been taking care of them, but there's, there's those telltale signs that you can see on an animal that, and that's a recent ride. Right. Yeah. If it's, you know, there's some up, yeah. up on the withers that are, that are white hair, you yeah. know, that's, 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 that's a saddle sore. Know, saddle sore. Yeah. Well, they, that horse has been ridden a lot or I actually had one this, this spring, I think I've soared two horses. This is one of them. And I was like, how in the world can I possibly put a, a white spot on this horse? But one side's going away. I'm like, I haven't ridden this horse much. And then I figured it out. I went out there 
put up a saddle on her, walked away, let her, man, I'll let her stand in that saddle for a while, come back. She had rolled. And every time you put a saddle on her, she'd try to roll and roll that saddle off. And then it would twist. And then that was gouging in right on that spot. Yep. You're like, are you kidding me? So we'll see. Hopefully that goes away because it, it wasn't from hard riding. I can tell you that because it was yeah. early on in the, in the uh, riding. So we'll, we'll have to see. But you still, you feel bad about it. It's like, damn it. You know, I'm not, I don't want to put a mark on this animal. Right. Well, it's not just, you just don't just cause that's not just us. It's not just representative of what, how we treat the animals, but it's also representative of, Oh, the horse people don't take care of their horses. You know, look at what they're right. doing to those animals. And so it's always very cognizant. It's always very much in our minds of let's make sure, you know, we don't want any marking to appear that they've been hurt. And that's why, you know, we were talking about spurs and I think it was a, in the shoot episode one time I had used spurs on a horse that, was also very sensitive in the skin and it created a big bruising. So what's the first thing I did? I made sure that she was rested because I didn't want to make essentially worsen that injury because it, it's what it is. It's a, it's not a bad injury, but it's, it's an injury nonetheless. And you don't want to make anything worse. Right. Just like putting a goose egg and hitting the head and having a goose egg right. only it's soft tissue. Yeah. No, yeah. it's, it's just from an irritant, but no, that's right. We want to, we want to do the best we can to not make that interaction that we make with that animal, in other words, riding them, uncomfortable for the horse, physically. Right. Mentally, they may be uncomfortable because they're, you're training them, and it's like, suck it up. I didn't like math either, so we're going to do this anyway. <laughs> I need to make you safe so you know we can get you to do some little bit of calculus for your owner when, <laughs> when they show up to really impress them. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think that kind of wraps up what – I wanted to talk about, uh, it makes, I think the big thing that we learned was, um, you know, any, any community is going to have good and bad. We always try to make sure that we represent the good and we do everything we can by making sure, you know, things like pens are clean, doing everything we can to take care of animals. When we see something is wrong, um, trying to help those animals, trying to make sure that no issues come up in the first place when, especially when we're talking about saddle swords and stuff like that. And that, we always put the welfare of our animals before anything else. And we always encourage others within not only the equine and the bovine, but any other animal community that they do the same. Well, you know, and, and to that end, um, I've had a couple of clinics that have been scheduled to do in the South, mm -hmm. what I call the South, you know, Tennessee, um, Georgia. I, so here, quick fact, nobody here in Kentucky considers themselves in the South. Blech considers themselves in the South. I do because even though it's North of the Mason Dixon line, when you talk with a drawl and you do things slower, you are in the South. And they eat a lot of barbecue. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. I mean, uh, of course we're, we're just Yankees, you know, yep. to them, but, uh, when, you know, I've had a couple of clinics scheduled to teach in the South and hadn't had a lot of luck. And fact is I've had some of them call back and want to know a little bit more about what I do and what I think. And, and they're, they're trying to skirt around. What do you teach? I'm like, look, I teach natural horsemanship and I don't use severe bits. I don't no leverage on, on our bits. And another, you know, those are just using some of the, some of the accoutrements that you use to train or to get uh, some, some response out of it. And there you can't, you can use bits, which is a probably a really good thing to go over at some point, but yeah, I'm writing it down. Oh yeah. Okay. But you know, it's all in your hands and then they'll, we'll get towards enhancing the gate. And I said, well, I'll teach that horse to, to gate based best on their confirmation. Yeah. And I, and, I, and then I'll look, if you're asking if I'm into big lick and that's what basically the soaring and the getting those horses to animate that front end is all about. It's, it's called the big lick. And, uh, I said, I am, against it i don't teach it fact is i teach people we shouldn't do it i'm not for it i don't like it i don't like what it does to the horse you want to do it you know you can do it but you're not doing it on my horse <laughs> you right. know and suddenly my clinics get canceled huh shocker so, <laughs> yeah so it's like i'm you know i'm a heretic uh to our uh our established show breed folks um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm trying to put them out of business is the way they look at it. 
the damn Yankees coming in there and, and trying to kill our, our heritage. And it's like, nah, this isn't always your heritage. That portion of it may be, but I don't know that I'd be really proud of that heritage. Right. But to me, uh, the, it, to me, it's, that's, they, they don't have the best interest of the horse in mind. Exactly. They've got the best interest of winning ribbons and, and pieces of tin again. Right. And, and that's yeah. all self-centric on them, not, not the animal. And that's why we that's always right. say we put the animal first. Right. Animals are to them. Animals are, uh, they're nothing different than a, than somebody who likes to drag race cars. And if they wreck a car, hmm, hmm. we'll just yeah. put together another one. Yeah. That costs us a little money, but Hey, we might, we might make one bigger and better. Yeah. And shocker folks, uh, cars don't breathe. They do, but they don't have a beating heart or anything like that. Yeah. If they break down a lot, then I call them having their own evil soul of their own. <laughs> <So> <laughs> is that too? Yeah. All right. Let's sign us off. All right. Well, you guys, we appreciate you watching and thank you till you're better paid.